afternoon, everyone, and especially uh, welcome to all of you who are at El Centro for the first time. Uh, El Centro is one of the great urban colleges, and it's an urban college that's getting better, and getting better through achieving the dream. Uh, for those of you who don't know that, uh, El Centro College is one of four community colleges in the Dallas County Community College District that are achieving the dream schools. El Centro, uh, Richland, and North Lake, and then Brookhaven was one of the original achieving the dream schools. And achieving the dream is funded by the Gates, the Lumina, and the Meadows Foundation. The Meadows uh, Foundation is especially active in Texas and they are responsible for our being part of this and for a number of other colleges in Texas. The goal of Achieving the Dream is to assist underrepresented and low-income students to complete all of their developmental coursework, to complete gatekeeper courses like English and math, to uh, complete attempted courses with a C grade or better, and to persist from term to term, year to year, and then finally to graduate. Uh, of course, this is not these are not only achieving the dream goals, but these very benchmarks are now being used in the state of Texas uh, as, uh, well, or soon will be, as part of our funding model. And of course, all of this uh, is directly related to our speaker's talks today. Uh, I'm introducing this afternoon Cal Newport, and Cal graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Dartmouth College in 2004 and earned a PhD in electrical engineering and computer science from MIT in 2009. He's currently a postdoctoral associate at MIT and is the author of How to Become a Straight-A Student, How to Win at College, and a book that's soon to be published, How to Be a High School Superstar, that will be uh, published in July 2010. Newport, Newport has appeared as a student success expert on ABC, NBC, and CBS, and over 50 radio networks, including ABC Radio, USA Radio, and XM Satellite Radio. His advice has been featured in major print publications, including the Washington Post, The Guardian, The Seattle Times, and some of the internet's most popular sites, including Lifehacker and Boing Boing. <laughs> his books have been taught in college classrooms and included in college textbooks, and his articles have appeared in the Wall Street Journal's College Journal, the Dartmouth Alumni Magazine, Flack Magazine, and FLYP Magazine, and College Bound Magazine. In addition, Newport runs Study Hacks, the internet's most visited student advice blog. Please join me in welcoming Cal Newport. Wow. So I have, a, I have a high school reunion coming up soon. I think I'm going to try to convince Dr. McCarthy to come with me and uh, introduce me to my friends there. <laughs> Although I've made something of myself. That's very nice. Uh, it's, it's, it's good to be here in Texas. I should say it's uh, good to be back because I was actually born and raised in Houston. Um, and actually, when I got here yesterday, I was very proud of this fact and sort of telling everyone, like, oh, I know Texas. I was raised here. Uh, and was sort of humbled this morning because I woke up and saw the weather forecast and it said it was 85 degrees. I was like, oh my God, it's a heat wave, right? I mean, the end of September, 85 degrees, this is terrible. And I get to the El Centro campus and everyone is like, oh man, it's such great weather, you're so lucky to have it. So it's true, Boston has made me weak and I'll be the first to admit it. I've lost that credibility. Um, but let's jump in here. This is what I want to talk about today. And I highlighted those two words because those are the two main points I want to hit in my talk. Uh, one, I'm not really interested in teaching you how to get slightly better grades or how to take sort of neater, or more organized notes or something like that. Uh, I'm interested in nothing less than teaching students to dominate at their college experience, be one of the top students in their courses consistently. Uh, at the same time, however, I, I, I don't have tolerance for students who tell me uh, my, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start for now, right, in college so that I can be happy later, right? I'll take, you know, take on too much, be really overloaded, that's okay, because if I can get that right job or get into the right four-year school or get into the right graduate program, then I'll be happy then, right? So I, I can spoil how that particular movie ends for you 
the uh, people who say I will suffer now so I can be happy later tend to keep pushing that definition of later farther and farther into the future until they sort of forget about it altogether. Okay? So I have no tolerance for that. I want nothing less than you to be able to be a top student in your course while enjoying your life right now. Okay? So that's an ambitious goal, but we have 30 minutes at least, so this shouldn't be too hard, right? So I wanted to start off by telling you about an academic research study. Uh, it's a study that I, I find fascinating. Uh, this was a study that was conducted by an economist at Dartmouth College named Bruce Sasserdo. And uh, Bruce Sasserdo had this, this insight. Uh, he noted that the, the freshmen arriving at Dartmouth College are assigned to their roommates at random. Okay? So you were no more likely to have something in common with your freshman class roommate when you arrived on campus than you were with any other student on campus. Sasserdo's insight was to wait until the end of the freshman year, then interview all the students at the end of the year and ask them about all sorts of traits. And what he was looking for was traits that freshman roommates were more likely to have in common at the end of the year than just two random students from the class. His insight was because we, uh, we, we assign people together at random at the beginning of the year, if at the end of the year roommates were more likely to have something in common, that must be because they are influencing each other's behavior. So he looked at lots of different traits. Uh, for some of these traits, freshmen, uh, the roommates didn't seem to have any sort of influence on each other. For example, the choice of major. What I majored in seemed to have very little in common with what my roommate chose to major in. But the one trait in which there was a very strong influence detected was GPA. And Sasserdo uh, hypothesized this is because study habits are very strongly influenced by our peers. Okay? So what we see our friends doing, other people doing, that's how we end up studying. Uh, so I, I arrived at Dartmouth College as a freshman about two months after Bruce Sasserdo published this study. And it took me about a month to observe the exact same effect that he had shown in that study. And I think this is probably familiar for many of you here, even at the high school or at the college level, you've probably noticed this same thing. And for me, the experience went like this. When I arrived on campus, uh, there's never any explicit discussions about how we were supposed to study. Right? We never sat there and were like, you know, I think that we should you know, space our study repetition by two weeks before the exam, and this is going to be optimal. We didn't have those conversations, right? That wasn't a cool thing to do. No one talked about how you were supposed to study. Nevertheless, within about a month, the entire freshman class was studying more or less the same way. Right? It was like we had, we had made an agreement, this is how we're going to study, even though we had never really talked about it. We had reached consensus on it because we had just observed what other people were doing, and we sort of tried to do the same thing. We never talked about it. We just sort of agreed, this is the right way to study. All right? And for us, this meant you were supposed to study at night. You were supposed to study in long stretches of time. Uh, if possible, you're supposed to wait until the day before something was due. That was the optimal time to do something. Uh, you were supposed to highlight your book. You're supposed to silently read your notes to yourself, and you're supposed to complain for every class about how long you worked on your homework the night before. Like, these were the rules. It was as if someone had written them down somewhere, but no one actually had. So I arrived. This is how everyone was studying. We never talked about it. I tried it for about a year and then kind of got fed up. And this is what's important to know about my own story at Dartmouth. I arrived at that college uh, arrogant. This was the year 2000. It was during the first dot-com boom. I was the co-founder of this little web development company when I arrived at college, and we were making good money because we were some of the first to figure out that you could outsource some computer programming overseas and therefore underbid your competitors. So I sort of arrived at college with this chip on my shoulder, and I was, uh, had this mindset of, uh, that the crowd, the way the crowd does things is often stupid because I was making a lot of money right then by doing something different than the crowd. So I put up with this for about a year, and I said, uh, enough, right? My grades are erratic. I don't have control over them. I hate staying up late. Enough with this. I don't care if this is how my friends are studying. I'm going to start from scratch. And I launched what I called the great experiment. I was going to throw out all of my assumptions about how you were supposed to study. I was going to ignore how my idiot friends were studying. And I was going to start from scratch running my own experiments to see what worked and what didn't work. So this here 
Uh, this is an actual screenshot of my transcript from Dartmouth College. I understand that Liam has a very similar slide. I think this is a common phenomenon about people who write or have success consulting on academic skills is that they usually have an experience like this where they have an epiphany moment. Well, here was mine. As you can see, the first three boxes of grades are the, the fall, the winter, and the spring quarter of my freshman year at Dartmouth when I was studying like everyone else was studying because this is what you were supposed to do. I got the typical grades you would expect from someone who is reasonably hardworking but didn't think much about how they were studying and was taking easy freshman courses. So I have A's, A minuses, there's a B plus in there. One of the grades is an NR. That's basically a course I was doing very poorly in. So I changed it over to be a pass fail course so that the bad grade wouldn't be recorded. That was my freshman year. That arrow points to the beginning of my sophomore year, the fall quarter of my sophomore year, the first quarter in which I had decided to run the great experiment, start from scratch, figure out for myself what worked and what didn't. And as you can see, I had a 4.0 in that quarter as well as every other quarter until I graduated from Dartmouth. And I ended up graduating with a 3.95 GPA. I was a few hundredths of a GPA point away from being the valedictorian, et cetera. But the point is, and this is the important stats about those three years, during that time I never once pulled an all-nighter. During that time I rarely ever studied past eight or nine o'clock at night. There was only maybe a handful of occasions where I got less than eight hours of sleep. It got to the point where by my senior year, I would sometimes lie to my roommates during finals period to pretend as if I was going off to the library to study because I just couldn't face that look on their face where they were gonna go off for yet another all-nighter. I couldn't admit to tell them that I was done and I was going to see my girlfriend and I'd probably still score higher than them on the test anyways, right? <laughs> that would have been bad roommate karma. So I couldn't face to tell them, but the point was, I had figured out that once you pay attention to how you study, it is possible to do very well as a student while at the same time not being completely overloaded with work, okay? And the transcript is supposed to be testimony to that. So eventually this sort of gap in my enjoyment of life and my peers' enjoyment of life got so large that this is when I decided I'm going to try to spread the word. This is why I wrote these books. I wrote the first one at Dartmouth and the second two uh, at MIT. It's why I started Study Hacks. What I want to do in my talk today is pull three insights out of these books, okay? So I don't have time to get into the details. You know, here's how you should take notes for a math class versus studying for a class just based on discussion. These, you know, these sort of details I go through in the books. What I wanted to do in our time today is hit three big ideas that I hope will change the way you think about being a student, right? It'll change the way you think about what it means to be a successful student, what type of strategies get you there, what type of sacrifices are required. All right, so let's do that. Here's the three topics we're gonna to cover. We're gonna start there with the books with the question that everyone wants to know, how to study. What should you do between when the information is first presented to you to when you sit down for a test to ensure that you're gonna get the highest possible grade while spending a reasonable amount of time working? Next, I wanna move on to an even more important question probably, which is procrastination. Many students tell me, you can give me all of the smart study projects and schedules and ideas in the world, but I'm a natural born procrastinator and I'm just not gonna do them. I'm gonna wait till the last second because that's just my personality. So I'm gonna try to knock that myth out of the water and teach you how anyone can avoid procrastination. And then finally, we're gonna talk about briefly a very important sort of philosophical topic that pulls this together, which is how to keep this mindset of dominating at college while still enjoying your life, while still being happy. Right? I've met too many students that are very efficient studiers have no issues with procrastination, yet are still overloaded, burnt out, and unhappy with their lives. So this final piece is sort of maybe the glue that's gonna hold the other insights together. How can we keep a mindset of domination while at the same time making sure that our lives are ones that we enjoy right now? All right? So let's dive right in. How to study. I figured the best way to, to let you into this insight is to tell you a story. Uh, this is actually a very recent story. This is something that happened about a month ago. So this is the first crowd I've actually told this story to. Uh, it's about a Lieutenant JG from the US Navy. I'm gonna call her Laura, even though that's not her real name, uh, because I haven't asked her yet if I can tell this story, but I don't think she's here today. Laura was at the US Navy's nuclear school, which is a six month crash course in nuclear physics, which the Navy makes their officers go through before they can serve on nuclear-powered submarines or nuclear-powered aircraft carriers. 
They're taking years of nuclear physics instruction. They're squeezing it into six months, uh, basically trying to teach them that whole curriculum in typical sort of efficient Navy style so they can go run reactors, nuclear reactors on these ships. Okay. So Laura was at nuclear school and uh, I had a phone conversation with her and she said, Cal, here's my problem. Uh, I am studying every hour of the day I have available to me right now. Uh, unless I gave up sleep altogether, I don't think there's any more hours in the day that I could be studying, yet I'm still performing poorly on these tests. You know, I don't know what else to do. This might sound familiar. This is the sort of typical, there's no more hours in the day gambit that I think most parents of college-age kids have heard at some point before to justify a grade. Mom, there's no more hours in the day. Do you want me to stop sleeping? So anyways, this is what she told me. No more hours in the day. I don't know what else to do. So I said, Laura, this is the first insight that I really want you to try to understand. The word study is meaningless to me. I would be happy if you would banish it from your vocabulary. It is vague. It is ambiguous. It gives me very little information about what you're actually doing. You might as well called me up and said that you're dally whopping every hour of the day. That, to me, has just as much information as telling me that you've been studying in every hour of the day. So I said, I want you to, I want you to banish this word from your vocabulary. I want you to re-explain to me your problem, but be specific. Get rid of this sort of vague, terrible, ambiguous word study. So she's like, all right, fine. Uh, at the nuclear school, the Navy, because they are typically pretty hand-holding, actually give us a, a sheets to fill out for notes, and it's split up by topic. And for every topic, they have some questions for that topic, and then a bunch of notes where you're supposed to fill in the blanks that have the information about that topic. She's like, so in lecture, of course, I fill in the blanks, I fill out my notes, and then what I do is I retype my notes, and then I, I read over them. I try to read over them to remember them. So I'm spending every available hour rereading over my notes, and I'm still performing poorly. As soon as Laura put it that way, as soon as she got that terrible, vague, ambiguous word study out of her vocabulary and talked about what she was actually doing, a light bulb went off over her head and she's like, oh, all right, I see. I see. Maybe, what I'm, maybe there's reading of my notes silently or whatever. Maybe this is not the right way to prepare for this particular test. This was the insight she had. Right? There are many different ways to prepare for a test, but only a small number of them are actually going to work well. The word study obscures this reality. It makes people feel like studying is studying, all that really matters is how long you do it. And it obscures this reality that no, there is a ton of different ways to prepare for a test. And if you're doing poorly, it's probably not because you're not putting enough hours, but a lot of it has to do with the fact that you're probably just happen to be using a poor strategy. But with the word study in people's heads, they just grab whatever strategy first pops to mind, whatever they see their friends doing, and they just assume that's what studying means and they don't think about there could be different ways to go forward here. So Laura was like, okay, I understand this now. Maybe reading my notes silently to myself is a terrible way to prepare for nuclear physics. Uh, what should I do instead? And that's where I said, okay, you're in luck because I'm gonna tell you what I'm also gonna tell you guys now, which is what I like to think of as the most important piece of study advice you'll ever hear. So as I said, there's many different ways to prepare for any test, but only a few work well. I'm about to teach you one way that is almost always one of those small number of things that works well. Right? The, the, the tactic I'm about to teach you was at the core of all of my A's at Dartmouth and at MIT. I used it for studying for art history just the same I used it to study for computer science and theoretical mathematics. It works for almost any subject. When I did surveys of Phi Beta Kappa students from across the country while researching my second book, tactic I'm about to tell you is the one that showed up most often on these surveys, right? So I want you to get as excited as it is possible to get about a study tactic, which is to say very, very excited about what I'm going to show you next, okay? The key, probably the most effective study technique that you can use is to be more like that guy, all right? Let me give you a little more detail. What is that guy doing? What he is doing is he is explaining a concept out loud in complete sentences as if lecturing a classroom without looking at any notes. I call that active recall. And it's probably the largest hidden secret of some of the top performing students in the country is the fact that this is the only study tactic they use to prepare for almost any topic. They explain concepts out loud in complete sentences 
as if lecturing a classroom and they do this without looking at their notes. This is in contrast to passive recall, which is just exposing yourself to information. Rewriting your notes, reading silently over your textbook, highlighting things, that's all passive recall. And that's a terribly inefficient way to learn material. Active recall, by uh, contrast, means you are actively trying to understand and synthesize and explain a concept without any help from any notes or any sort of textbook. And this is how learning actually happens. So three points. I want you to know three points about active recall. One, it is devastatingly effective. If you successfully do active recall on a concept, you will understand that concept, you will remember that concept, you could be asked on a test three months later to answer a question on that concept and you'll be able to get that question right. Two, active recall is incredibly time efficient. It takes much less time to do active recall on a concept than it does to reread over that concept five, six, seven, eight times hoping that it sticks. This is a big part of the reason why I never had the study past 9 p.m. and never pulled all-nighters because this is a very time efficient way of studying. There's no sitting in the library reading over your notes a thousand times. Three, and this is kind of the catch, active recall is difficult. It is mentally uncomfortable. When you're doing it, you're straining. Your brain is straining because it's trying to pull together these different things that it had learned before and try to put them into a, a, a shape that it understands. It's trying to express them. This is very taxing on your brain. It is very difficult. What I'm here to tell you is that feeling of uncomfortableness is unavoidable. That is the feeling of learning, right? It's the exact same analog as lifting a weight at a gym, for example. If you're trying to get bigger muscles, right, you need your muscles at some point to be tired. It needs to be uncomfortable or they're not going to develop. Active recall is a little bit uncomfortable, and that's because it's the strain of learning. All right? So because of that, you can't stay up all night before a test and do active recall eight hours in a row. The best you're going to be able to manage for is maybe one or two hours at a time. And that's why top students tend to break up their studying into one or two hour chunks of active recall, spread over up to a week or two before an exam actually starts. All right? So I know you're saying, I know I can't do that. I'm a procrastinator. We'll cover that next. So this was the insight I wanted Laura to know. Active recall is the only study time that counts. I wanted her to think about it that way. Rereading her notes, highlighting, forget about it. That is passive recall. You are not learning when you're doing that. Active recall is the only time that counts. So she said, OK, I'll try it. She went back to study for her next test. What she did was she went for each concept in her notes. She would look at the questions at the top and cover over the notes below. She would try to answer those questions in a lecture out loud as if talking to an audience, as if teaching an audience about it. If she was able to more or less give a good lecture, she put a check mark next to it. If she stumbled, she put an X next to it and would decide she would come back to it later and try again. She studied until she had gotten a check mark next to every concept. Right? She had been able to do active review, active recall on each of the concepts. So she calls me uh, around dinner time the night before the test and it says, uh, you know, Cal, I'm worried. I did the active recall. I have a check mark next to every concept. Every concept I was able to explain out loud. It was hard, but I've, I've done it over the last week. And now I'm done. And all of my friends are still here. They're still studying. When I left, they were still here studying. Um, and I feel guilty about this. I feel like I should be working more. I should be working harder. And I said, Laura, just give it a try. Right? Give active recall a try, just this one test. And sure enough, a few days later, she calls and says, she got the highest grade on that test that she'd ever gotten at nuclear school. And it was one of the three highest grades on that test out of the whole school. Okay? So the active recall works. She studied less than almost anyone else in that school, yet ended up with one of the highest grades. And right, that's the magic of active recall. So this is the strategy I want you to take away from this particular section. When you're thinking about how you study, eliminate any study time that is not active recall or preparation to do active recall. Ignore everything else. You should fear passive recall like the plague. If you're not actively explaining something without looking at your notes, you're not really learning it. All right, so that wasn't too bad. There it was. That was the most important piece of study advice you're ever going to hear. OK, so as I predicted, many of you might be saying, uh, I can't do that, right? I can't start a week early and do these sort of bursts of active recall. I'm a procrastinator. In fact, actually, let me ask you. I, I just want to calibrate the crowd. 
raise your hand right now, just so I know, if you're someone who feels like you have an issue with procrastination. Just put your hand in the air if you feel like this is an issue that you have. Most people are raising their hand, and the people who haven't mean to, they just haven't gotten around to it yet. They're going to do that later. <laughs> yeah. That's a procrastination joke. I got a whole bunch of procrastination jokes if you need them. I want to convince you guys that this is actually nonsense. There is no such thing as procrastination as being a personality trait. Procrastination is not a weakness or something that people are born into. It is something that anyone can overcome. I want you to believe that there is no such thing as a natural born procrastinator. Okay? So to teach you this, let's use an example. Let's imagine a student named Brian. This is Brian's brain. I am showing you his brain because I'm going to make the argument that procrastination has everything to do with the way the brain is wired and has nothing to do with your personality or some sort of weakness in your character. Okay? Let's imagine uh, it's 4 p.m. on a Thursday and Brian has a psychology midterm on Monday. Okay? It's a giant midterm, it's worth half his grade. He feels very guilty about this. He says, this is a really big midterm, it's very important, I should be doing a lot of work, otherwise I'm gonna feel guilty. So he says to himself, you know what, um, I think what I should do really is just go study the crap out of my psychology textbook, right? I mean, this, I just I feel guilty if I'm not working, that's what I need to do. Not surprisingly, his brain says, eh, whatever, I don't know, the TV, come on, the Facebook, you need to be over there, and he puts it off, right? Classic procrastination story. And the question is, why did Brian procrastinate there? So here's the argument I want to make. It's not because he is a natural born procrastinator. I want to say that his brain is doing exactly what you would expect his brain to do. In more detail, you guys got to remember, our brain is sort of a marvel of millions of years of evolution. And one of the things that it is very, very good at doing is achieving goals, right? It's very good at saying, here is a very important goal, and I am going to figure out what path gives me a good chance of succeeding this goal, and then I'm gonna go do that, right? You're a caveman on the savanna, you see a herd of elephants, you have this goal that I want to kill and eat an elephant. Your brain agrees that is a very good goal because we need to eat this live, right? The caveman thinks, well, maybe one thing I could do is just run into the middle of this herd of elephants with a club and just try to club the big one to death, right? The brain's like, look, I, I have some past experience with elephants and, and you're clubbing, and I'm kind of predicting the future here. This doesn't have a really good chance of succeeding. So what does the brain do? It doesn't make you motivated. It doesn't send out those chemicals that motivate you. On the other hand, that safe caveman says, well, I could also stand on this cliff and throw a spear. I'm pretty good at throwing spears. The brain is like, yes, 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 I can predict the future. You're very good at the spear. That'll probably hit the elephant. It's very safe. And the caveman gets filled with feelings of motivation, like, I want to do this, right? It's the brain's way of making sure that we follow the plans that make sense and avoid the plans that are going to get us, uh, you know, whatever, trammeled by elephants, right? I mean, this is, this is what the brain does. I want to argue that this is what happened with our example with Brian. When he had this sort of vague plan, like, oh, I just want to go study the crap out of my psychology textbook, to Brian's brain, that was like the idea that I'm going to rush into the middle of the elephants with a club. Right? It was like, what is this plan? This is this sort of vague idea. You just feel guilty. You have no idea how you're going to study. You're going to sit there with the computer open and doing text messaging and sort of half studying, half not. And, and we're not going to get much done. It's going to be painful. I'm predicting the future. This doesn't seem like a really good plan with a high probability of success. So the brain is like, you know, I'm out of here. You're not going to get, you know, motivation from me. That is the moment of procrastination. And this is the, the point I'm trying to make. Procrastination is not a personality trait. It's your brain's way of telling you that your plan's no good. Right? It is wired to say, is this a good plan for achieving this goal? And when you have a vague sense of, like, I should study because this thing is big and I don't really know what study means and I probably keep my cell phone open all the time, it knows that's a bad plan. It's basically outsmarted you. Right? Here's my advice for overcoming that. The three hows is a strategy that gets the brain onto your side when it comes to studying. When the brain is on your side, you will feel motivation. You will not feel the urge to procrastinate nearly as strong. So all you need to do is answer three questions for yourself. How am I going to study this material? How long am I going to study this material? How do I actually know that this is a good way to study? Right? 
if you can give convincing answers to these three questions, your brain will be on your side. It'll say, this plan makes sense. This plan has a high probability of succeeding. I'm gonna give you motivation, right? So if we go back to Brian, if instead of saying, I'm gonna study the crap out of my psychology textbook, he's like, oh, I'm gonna do active recall in the first two weeks of my material, and I'm gonna do this between four and six in Baker Library, and this is part of a larger study plan I have. We'll have me completing all the active recall by Sunday morning so I can have some rest and get a full night's sleep, and I know active recall works because Cal said so, and I've tried in other classes. If he says that, answering the three hows, his brain's like, yeah, let's do that, right? And it actually works this way. And it's something you'll actually observe. If you observe some of the highest scoring students at any school, you'll often find that procrastination is not an issue for them. They're starting their work early, they're focused, they have no issue getting down to the library a week before a test to start their review. This is a big reason why, is because the top students are often also the students who think a lot about how to study. What's a tactic that's gonna work? How do I know this works? They're running experiments like I did in my own life. And when you're thinking about studying that way, when you're in essence answering the three hows about your study tactics, your brain is much more likely to be on your side. It's much more likely to be motivated. So procrastination is not an issue. All right, so we can sidestep this problem. Just remember the three hows. All right, let's get to something less scary. Final point, final big point I wanna to make to you guys today. The notion of happiness, as I said, Again, I advise hundreds and hundreds of students, and I see all the time students who are very efficient studiers, who have no issues with procrastination, but are still overloaded, burnt out, and unhappy with their lives. So what I wanna end with here, my final topic, is a philosophy, an approach to student life, consistent with what I've shown you, but also consistent with making sure that you enjoy your life right now. This guy's name's Toph. He's a little bit kooky, a little bit weird, to be honest with you, but he has a fascinating story, and I think it highlights a really important point. So I want to tell you Toph's story. He went to Skidmore. He graduated last year. This is a screenshot from his calendar of a typical week during the fall semester of his junior year. Toph was a very hardworking but also overloaded student. Right? This is, the calendar shows classes and meetings. You can see his scheduled day starts around 9 a.m. and ends as late at 11 p.m. The schedule does not include the time he actually has to spend doing the work, actually studying for his classes, doing the problem sets, doing the work that his clubs require. This is what he told me when I first met him. He, uh, he had expected that just doing an overwhelming amount of stuff was going to empower him. He figured this is what ambitious students are supposed to do. This is how you impress the world. You do lots and lots of different things. But instead of empowering him, he said that end of that semester met me with painful exhaustion. He felt like all those responsibilities had basically taken control of his life. Perhaps most heartbreakingly, he told me, I just had this feeling that oh, I had done very much, right? I, I've been in all these classes and all these clubs and all these meetings and I was up really late every night. He had accomplished very little. He couldn't look back and be like, here's something I accomplished that I'm proud of, something that would impress someone. He was just always running around one thing to the other. So he was a typical student. No issue with his study habits. He read my books. I, you know, he was an efficient guy, overloaded, burnt out, unhappy with his life. His story is interesting because of this turn of events. That next semester after that one I showed you, he was an exchange student in Sydney, Australia. And when he got there to Australia, some unexpected things happened. So the first thing he tried to do was sign up for lots of advanced courses. Right, so he signed up for, I wanna take all of it because I have to be taking a huge amount of courses, they're all very advanced. However, in Australia, as an exchange student, Toph was at the bottom of the pecking order and he didn't get into those courses. It ended up only getting into one, so he took four courses, only one of which was advanced. So then he went to try to sign up for a lot of clubs. He figured, okay, but this is what I did in Skidmore, this is what I'm gonna do here. I need to have lots and lots of different clubs. But it turns out at this university in Sydney, in order to sign up for any club, you had to have a club ID card that cost $200. And he's an exchange student, that was his beer money, he didn't have it. So he couldn't join any clubs. Finally, he took a part-time job to make a little bit more money. That conflicted with one of his courses so he had to drop that course. So he ended up taking only three courses, no clubs, one part-time job, right? 
this is what makes Toph's story interesting is because his life is like a living laboratory. He went from the busiest possible schedule in one semester and the very next semester went to one of the uh, most uncrowded possible schedules. Same person, same time period, he was trying both strategies. So it's like an experiment. His life acts as an experiment. So this is what was interesting about Toph's story to me. Uh, here's what happened. In the classes, right, he was only taking three classes, had plenty of time to spend on these classes. He thought he had learned more in that semester than he had in his first two full years at Skidmore. He was able to immerse himself in the work. He didn't constantly feel overwhelmed, like I have to get this done right now because I have eight more classes coming up pretty soon. Uh, and because of that, he could really get into the material. He got A's in those courses. His professors thought he was a star. Because he had time, he didn't feel a contempt for his work. He didn't feel like it was an obligation that was always pulling at him. Procrastination wasn't even an issue for him. Right? So he became an academic star because he had time and space to spend on these courses. Same thing happened on the extracurricular front. He didn't have all these clubs, but he did have this one job because like many of us, he needed to make money. But because he hadn't cluttered his schedule around that job, he was able to give it his full attention. This was at a software company, and pretty soon a, an opportunity came up for him to help with a project, and he could give it his full attention, and he really impressed them, and they gave him another project, and he could drop everything for three days because he didn't have much to drop, and, and really work on that project. And he ended up working on a task force with the chief marketing officer of this company, impressed him so much that when he left Australia, they said, Toph, we want you to keep consulting for us back. When you get back to Skidmore, we want you to keep working from us for us from afar, right? So extracurricularly, all of a sudden, he became a star. And socially, things went well. He had energy, his character grew stronger, he had time for his friends, okay? So in essence, when Toph was trying to do as many things as possible, he was burnt out and was accomplishing very little. When he went to a schedule that had more space in it, but he really took what he did seriously, he became an academic star with straight A's that the professors loved. He became a star in his, his job, and they offered him a consulting gig, and his, his, his life was happier to live. He comes back to Skidmore. This was his schedule his first semester back from Australia. His classes were done by noon each day. He had no clubs. He could put all of his time in the afternoon onto the, doing his work, this consulting work for that company. He really enjoyed his life. He was a straight A student. That company ended up offering him a job after his graduation, an excellent job after his graduation. In other words, Toph tried both lifestyles. The impressive people do as much as possible lifestyle and the do less but do better lifestyle. And there was a clear winner. And this was the insight he had. And the insight I want you to take away, he noticed your ability to do one or two things really well goes farther than the total volume of work you do. And the strategy that we came away with from TOEF was that you should do less, but do what you do very well. Right? Don't cram in perhaps more courses than you need to at a certain time just because you think it'll somehow look better to take more courses, but do the courses the normal load very well. Don't cram lots and lots of activities into your schedule, uh, perhaps jobs you don't need because you think it looks good to be involved in lots of things. Do a very small number of things, but do those things very well. And what Toph's story sort of proves to us is not only does that lead to a more enjoyable, sort of satisfying life, but that actually makes you more of a star. That makes you more of a standout. It makes you the type of person that people are gonna remember and are gonna give opportunities to. Right, so those are my three topics. Just to, to, to remind those for you, when it comes to studying, the word study is meaningless. You have to talk about specifics, and the specific tactic I promote the most is active recall, out loud, complete sentences. I know it looks weird to talk out loud to yourself, but I'm telling you, it works out loud, complete sentences without looking at your notes. It will cut your study time in half. Stop thinking of yourself as a procrastinator. This is not your personality. This is your brain telling you that your plan sucks. Get better plans by answering the three hows. How am I going to study? How long? How do I know this is right? You get in the habit of answering those questions, procrastination won't be an issue. Finally, the overarching idea to have here, do less, do better. Again and again, this comes up as a strategy that lives, uh, you know, leads to lives that are successful and interesting, but also satisfying to live. Okay? And guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it there, but I do want to say if you want to learn more and you want more details and you want to know about how should you study for a math class versus this class, the stuff I didn't have time for, I'm going to point you towards my website, calnewport.com. You don't even need to buy my books. Most of the material you need is there in the archives on this blog. You can email me from there. I can answer your questions. I'm happy to do it. 
So the conversation can continue there. And I'm going to leave it at that. And thank you very much.